as I sort of stopped working, um, so we bought this house in the country, been doing a few bits around that, so which I'm enjoying more than I thought I would, so that's good. Okay. Um, uh, but I'm, I still need intellectual stimulation, so I'm trying to write a book at the moment, a political book on right. my labour lost and seats in the election year. Um, I went back to do, I, think I told you to do, to university last year, yep. to do an MSc in politics, which yep. I really enjoyed. Yeah. I needed the intellectual stimulation, really. So. Absolutely. So uh, you got the, uh, the degree now? Yeah, yeah. So that was good. Yep. Yeah. I won the prize for best dissertation. So that's good. <laughs> wow. But, but that, that's, 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 that's awesome. I think as, an older student, as an older student, I think I put more hours in than the other students. <laughs> <laughs> I, was up in the li- I was up in the library at 8.30 most mornings and I didn't see many people in the library till 10.30, 11. So. Uh, you, but, you, um, you, you, yeah, no, it's good. So I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, well, I've been debating what. So what? Uh, yeah, so I've been debating what to do next, really. So um, whether I do a PhD, and then I thought, oh, I'm going to just write this book. So I'm thirty-five thousand words in. Um, I don't know whether I could get a publisher because it's a very niche political book, but I'll just self-publish it if uh, if needs yeah. be. Yeah, so that's it's just been a project. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so it was. I'm about 30,000 words into a, into a book, so but it's been put a little bit on hold. I'm actually going to fly, fly around here at the moment. I can see. <laughs> Welcome to Australia. Um, so um, I just hope he's not carrying the coronavirus. That's what I'm really worried about. <laughs> yeah, The world seems to have gone mad on the coronavirus. I mean, the markets are down today. The, the FTSE futures are down 6% today which is sort of over 20% in the last sort of seven or eight days. It's exactly the same here in Australia. So it's just madness. Um, people are buying toilet paper uh, here. Oh, I know. What, is, what is it about toilet paper? <laughs> I I'm don't not, understand it. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I just um, it, It's more a toilet paper epidemic than actually a coronavirus at the moment. So it's just um, ridiculous. But, um, anyway. The real problem is it becomes self-fulfilling. If everyone stops flying, airlines go bust, et cetera. And so... I just think people have to just calm down a little bit. Um, I hope so. It's, yeah, it's just it's it a bit really mad crazy. for me. Yeah, yeah. The, mar- the markets are going to get hammered today. I mean, just going to get completely hammered. So, as someone who owns quite a lot of shares, I don't like that either. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, I'm a little bit in the same boat. So, um, it's it'll be what it'll be. Um, just make sure I'm not retiring next year. It's fine. But, but <laughs> well, I think that's the key. If you, if you don't want to be buying an annuity anytime soon, take a few <laughs> years to recover from this. I think. I think it will. Yeah. Um, so you got the questions? Uh, yeah, I got those. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's really just a fireside chat. I, uh, I've always been impressed by what you've done over the years uh, as we've chatted and I've discovered, you know, about what you've done. And uh, that's why I wanted to, and I know you're taking a sabbatical and maybe having an existential crisis in terms of what you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, always in an existential crisis. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what I'm going to do is I'm recording it in video as well as audio because I'm using it to create as you would really appreciate coming from a content <laughs> social media data uh, business before. Um, we're just going to turn it into uh, both audio is the primary but then it's also some video and uh, you might even take snippets out of it and um, share bits of your story so all right so what I'll do is I'll introduce you I'll start it and uh, and then we'll get going and um, we'll uh, have a chat all right okay that sounds good excuse me a sec give me one second just gonna slow my nose Okay. All right. Cool. Right. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Jeff Buller Show. Um, today, we're going to be interviewing Steve Rayson. And before I actually have a chat with him, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read a little bit about what Steve has done. Now, Steve uh, and I met, it was in Dublin in Ireland a few years ago at a conference and uh, we got to chat and I'd heard about him but I had never met him in person. So I, we got to uh, chat over a glass of wine 
um, and some coffees. Um, and I got to know Steve and what was really nice is we became friends and uh, he came to visit us in Sydney um, and uh, we got to know each other over the years. So Steve is one of these special dudes, as they call them in America, um, okay, and or a chap, as they say in England. Um, he's actually a, a serial entrepreneur. So he's actually started three businesses. So Steve originally worked in the management consulting for KPMG and Ernst & Young before becoming a serial entrepreneur. Steve has set up and grown and sold three companies. Now, not many people have done that. So one of them is Kineo, which is an e-learning company. And the last one he exited from just a couple of years ago is BuzzSumo, which some of you might have heard of before. It's a social media data company. Now, he's passionate about startup businesses and growing them without venture capitalists or institutional investment. So welcome to the show, Steve. I've been looking forward to having a chat with you. And um, uh, let's just find out a little bit more about uh, what's your secret source and uh, what are some of your inspirations. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice to be here. And it looks sunny in Australia, which is, uh, it's, not, it's not sunny here in England. <laughs> no, well, uh, I, I have been in England quite a few times and uh, <laughs> I've, I've mostly been there in summer and most of the time the sun has shown up. So it, maybe it's because I'm an Aussie and I drag a little bit of sunshine. Oh, yeah. Hope, well, bring the sunshine. We've had two months of solid rain. It, even for us, it's been really wet. So. <laughs> is that right? Okay. But no, lovely to be here. <laughs> it's great. Well, we've had, uh, as most people know around the world, that uh, Australia's a little bit of a country of uh, fire and drought. And uh, we've had some pretty tough times late last year. Um, and But lately we've been having some rain too, so it's great to have a little bit of that. So, so Steve, thank you for uh, agreeing to actually be on the show. And what I'd like to start with is, okay, so you're working as a management consultant, right? and you go, I want to be an entrepreneur. So where did that come from? What was the inspiration that uh, got you into that space? I suppose, I suppose the inspiration really was the internet and the or to um, change the way things were done with the internet. I was working in the mid eighties and early nineties when there was no internet. Yep. And, um, and I managed to get on a program in, in, uh, to look at you know, how you could change delivery of service, keep out what the internet could do and the potential of it. Yep. It got me quite like to run a business in this space, really. So that's, right. that's really what got me into it. It's really the inspiration of things you could do. And I started off by thinking about learning and how you could deliver learning online, and deliver tutoring online and things like that. And that's why I got into the e-learning side of things initially. Right. Yeah, I remember that uh, when I was um, in the mid '90s, when the browser showed up, you know, Netscape and so on, and I, it was when you're using modems at you know, 9600 board. And what was fascinating was um, I said, "This is going to make libraries redundant." You know, is that you know the ability to get information? And sure, it took 20 searches to find something that was actually useful <laughs> back then. <laughs> but so. So e-learning was your first inspiration. So uh, you said you started three companies. Were there something before Kineo? Was that? Um... Uh, no, uh, the, um, basically uh, Kineo, partway through Kineo, we also started another company, which was a, um, a learning management system company. Right, uh, okay. Corto, which was also sold on. So um, yeah, so two were in the e-learning space. And then once, once I did e-learning, uh, that was a services business. And services businesses are really hard. I mean, what I learned from that was, you know, fundamentally a services business model was I was buying people and selling people. Okay, I was packaging them as a project, so I was saying it's $50,000 or whatever to, to this project, but I was really packaging people's time. So in a services business, you have to be really good at buying people at one price, selling them at another price, because that's really what you're doing, you're selling time. Um, and you also have to be really good at managing utilization, so making sure that everyone's on chargeable time, um, you know, because it's not like a work to you. If you don't sell your developer's time this morning, you've lost it forever. You can never sell it again. So yep. all the time, making sure that everyone's chargeable. And we sold it and it was a business. It was cash um, rich, et cetera. But then I wanted to move into business. So that's when I then moved into BuzzSumo and a completely different type of business, which is well, but right. it became so more scalable. And that, that was the potential of small product businesses and where, I think the internet gives 
you know, it's a way to start a small business because the internet gives you so much really. So we could scale quite quickly. We could look like a big company and all those things. Um, but the product business was just a completely different type of business. It was much more about marketing rather than sales, really, relatively low value products. So yep. we were just marketing. So people were building brand awareness was really important in the product space. Whereas in the services business, really 20 or 30 big clients like BP and Vodafone and people like that would buy from us at a reasonably, you know, we would sell 100 through to 100,000 of them. Um, Whereas when you're selling a product at $99, as we was at Simo, then we need a lot of clients. So it's very, it was a very different type of business. So yeah, I was in the, the services and then a product business. But in both cases, there were small, what I call bootstrapped businesses. We didn't go and get investor money. We weren't looking, to, we were looking to grow, um, you know, relatively small company up to a 10, 20 million turnover and then sell it. And that's, been my approach really rather than not trying to build a huge business i really love all the you gotta got to fly this yeah <laughs> Those flies in australia <laughs> he's very pesky he's yeah. very pesky actually very, yeah <laughs> yeah very pesky yeah he's very he's very keen on you but um yeah i mean you guys are starting a business but um i said my approach has always been to bootstrap them it's to be in a key to an investor we've invested with very little money maybe 10 20 000 dollars all we had to, to get going with really sometimes less um but we started to build it and i'm sort of quite unusual that i quite like small businesses to be profitable. so we were always profitable virtually from the first six months in uh, to the business whereas a lot of the the books that you read about growing a business you have some money you don't worry about profitability you just scale 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 and profitability comes later of course if you're bootstrapping that doesn't work so you need to build a business that's profitable quite early on. So I've always built relatively small businesses, but they went up to $10, $20 million, and we've sold them for sort of up to $20 a piece, which for me is great. Um, you know, not trying to be a billionaire, but make reasonable money out of it. So it was a very different approach. So it was very much about bootstrapping the business. Yeah. So it, what was very interesting to hear you talking about too was you realised that the services business uh, was going to be very hard to scale. So, and you use the word scalability, and that was the one thing yeah. that you learned by doing something that you realised was hard to scale. And went, okay, this is all about trading time for money in a sense, wasn't it? Really. So you're actually yeah. um, exactly, exactly. So services businesses are good businesses. They're cash rich generally. You tend to be good cash flow on those businesses. But if I want to double the size of the business, I've really got to double the number of staff because I'm selling staff time. That's you right. Know, there's a limit to how much you can charge per day for somebody. So, and it's great if you're a censure and they do have tens of thousands of staff that they're selling. But then you've got to be good at, at say, recruiting staff, managing staff. And what I found out quite quickly was I love the technology. I love the, you know, the brand building of a new business. And once you get it to a certain size, and once you get 20, 30 staff, your job becomes managing the business a lot more and really I'm, I'm really not so keen on managing large numbers of teams of staff, why they're not working so well and all those sorts of things. Um, so I really start to build the brand from scratch. I love the risk you take from just building something, growing that business. And I say when we built Persimo, I'd never worked in social media about social media. Yep. So it was exciting. I had to go in and find who was, there so you and other people who knew a lot more about social media um and i had a simple strategy which is you know who are the who are the people that the people who are going to buy our product respect? and so i just built a list of about 20 people including yourself saying okay. these are people I, who know about our product who can mention our product and i've become friends with you know probably half of those those people now and it which has been love like ron fishk and i met to know and we met and, and we're on holiday together down in Japan. And it's great to build those friendships. You meet new people and you get new perspectives. Um, but I think the way into the business is to find out people that your customers respect and get to know them and see whether you, you can build relate to those people because just mentions from those people is really useful. What's even more important become advocates of yours. And I'd say quite a few of those people became advocates. They liked the product, what we were doing. 
and that really helped grow the business. We didn't spend a dollar on advertising with Buzzsumo in the early days, the first two or three years. We grew mm -hmm. primarily through word of mouth. Um, and so that was a really important part of growing a bootstrap business. It's, if you take millions of investment money, you can suddenly spend loads on advertising. We couldn't do that. So it was like, okay, let's, let's build relationships with influencers. Let's build a blog. Let's build useful content that people find for to them in doing their work. And so the blog we built was just about, okay, let's provide information support to marketers, not that necessarily sales per sumo, but we want people to understand that we're trying to give away some value that it's a practical, helpful blog. And we built that blog up to sort of 10, 20, 30,000 readers. And that was really useful. So we tried to, in ways that didn't cost us too much money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's really important. So we're, we're in the middle of a, a time now where people are literally raising two, $300 million and not making money for years. Um, and uh, it, it, that's a tough gig. And, um, yeah, you know, and some of them pulled it off. Uh, like I, you know, Amazon's done that. That's what's been amazing that he built that yeah. incredible scale and wasn't profitable for I think quite quite a few years. Um, but built a global brand. Now, so the inspiration. So what I heard from you too was that you actually said the inspiration um, to start was actually a curiosity about what the internet could do. Um, so, so would you say you're a, a sort of like a curious sort of guy? So, yeah, so how, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think paranoid curiosity. That's how I describe myself. <laughs> okay. sort of paranoid curiosity, because I'm, I'm always worried that I'm missing out. What's happening in the world? What technology is changing? What's, yeah. you know, the next big thing? So I'm, I read loads about lots of topics. I'm forever on those articles, et cetera. So um, I'm really interested in what the opportunities are. And the internet just thrown up so many opportunities. So you can, you can set up a business really cheaply these days. You can use things like Slack to have a remote team. At Buzzsumo, we didn't have an office. We just had a remote team using Slack, for example. You can use great accounting software like Xero. Yep. You can use Stripe to take your payment. We can set up a whole system to take payments, use Xero, push it into the accounts, et cetera. We can build a blog um, you know, just using WordPress as we did. And suddenly you've got a, a business there. Um, this is amazing, really. There's so much either free software or very low cost software that you can put together the essence of a core business. So, yeah, I'm always curious about what you can do and what's changing. And you'd have new business models. I mean, the Buzzsumo business model couldn't have been around years ago because all we did was crawl websites, put all that data into a database. And then we charge people effectively for access to the Buzzsumo database. So that's yep. what we did. So we're charging $99 a month. But once you cover your edge customer is a pure profit customer effectively. Yep. So that works incred incredibly well. So um, your curiosity then inspired you to start Buzzsumo after you'd obviously sold the uh, e-learning business. So that was an observation of, of social media and what was happening in that space. Is that so where that came from? Or um, it, it came from a different place, really. I'd sold Kineo. I was locked out of working in e-learning. So the people who bought it said, you can't work in e-learning for so many years. So I was looking for something to do. And so I was doing, as I often do, I'm going around tech forums. I'm looking on Reddit, seeing what people are mentioning. And I came across a particular forum where these two guys had built an early version of the Buzzsumo, who at that time was just find content that's most shared. Yep. Um, and so I started to people want to play with it, give us feedback. And I thought, I really like this. So I asked James and Henley. I contacted James and said, you know, would you like to make this into a proper business? You know, could I invest, et cetera? And he just yep. said, well, I don't know, because Henley's in New York, I'm in London, we've never met, this is just a fun hobby. So basically, I went to see them and persuaded them that this could be a business. And so it was really their initial idea. And I was really just seeing the potential. And it took me a while. It took me about six months because they were thinking, who's this old guy coming in saying, <laughs> leave your work, and et cetera. So um, it took a while to persuade them, but um, then persuaded them to set up Buzzsumo. Um, and uh, had James came on first and then a little later. So it was really their initial idea. But I was doing what I was doing, which is I was scanning text forums, I mean, developers, and this was a pet project. And I just thought it had lots of potential. So fortunately, I managed to persuade them to come out to Buzzsumo. Um, worked very well. We had, we built the product quite quickly. We had a, a free B matters when you're building software projects because we didn't have lots of money for advertising. So beta, we had loads of people using it and giving us feedback. And 
I'd say most of us Sumo came from our customers. They didn't really come from us. A lot of customers saying, could you do this? Could you show us what's been trending today? And we're saying, yeah, let's build that in. Um, and so we had lots of feedback from customers on the beta version. We launched the full version. Um, we got people paying straight away. So I launched in the September. I think at the end of that month, we had 100 paying customers, right. which was amazing. It grew from there and grew from there. Um, but the freemium product market, we, we had almost, I think, almost 600,000 people on. So a huge number of people. And I, we'd have never got that if it wasn't because it was really useful. <laughs> we probably gave away too much of that, um, but it was incredibly, because it was valuable, people would say to friends, oh, you should look at this, you should use Basumo, there's a free. We gradually charged for different features. Um, but yep. even at the end, overwhelming bulk of the customers were freemium customers. And marketing in a world have money for advertising, a freemium product can work very well. The debt is the freemium product is you're always competing with a base price of zero. <laughs> Why should I pay anything? Because I've got this base product at zero. So there are risks in freemium products, but we, we managed to persuade people that it's worth paying $99 for all the, the extra services that we were providing. Um, yep. And we gradually restricted some of the freemium features, etc. But freemium really got us going. We would never have got 600,000 subscribers without having a freemium product, I think, unless we had a massive advertising budget. Yeah. So did you start off just doing a freemium uh, model uh, first and then added a price later? Or was it actually uh, free for basic and then you actually added premium at an at additional cost? Um, we always knew we were going to charge. So that's the first thing. We always knew we were but when we put the beta out there, I think we were so, so impressed with having the beta. We knew if we suddenly charged for everything, we'd lose all those, those people and we'd lose goodwill, et cetera. So we then designed it so that we had a free version. You could have so many purchases, et cetera, and then a paid version. So we always knew we were going to charge. But when the beta was in just getting attention and people and people talking about it, cut off that goodwill either. I mean, obviously, we offered people who were beta users a you know, a lifetime root deal to, to come on board because we mm -hmm. wanted to keep that goodwill. Um, but um, we gradually then added a premium tier and then we added another premium tier because we found, to our surprise really, that we thought marketers would use the tool. And I think it's again, you learn from customers and I think you can have a plan, but the key is to be flexible. I really like the quote from Mike Tyson, which is everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And it's <laughs> like that, it? That's right. you have to be flexible. You know, stuff happens, you have to be flexible, but we were marketing it for small, small marketers, small organizations, then yeah. big organizations used it. And then the publishers came in. So some of our big customers were people like BuzzFeed and people like that. So, and suddenly they've got hundreds of users and they think, well, this is not quite right, $99 a month. So we have to then create a higher tier product. <laughs> okay, you can pay $1,000 a month. Um, so we created different services for them. Um, but I think, the key lesson from that was in, in any small businesses, you have to be flexible. Stuff happens. You just have, you go where your customers are. It's a bit like pricing. People said, well, that's up with $99. I spoke to dozens of pricing consultants. You told $99 and I should charge $9 a month or $20 a right. month. Okay. And that finally said, why don't you just start at 99 and you can always come down. It's hard to charge people 10, take it to 99. So that first month, we put it out at night, put the finger in the air, what will people value? Because yep. it's going to save people a lot of time. So we started at 99, and we never changed it because everybody just bought it at 99. Um, you know, we could have started much lower. Maybe we could have started higher. It was a sort of psychological pricing point. Yep. But pricing is really hard, really hard. That's the other thing I learned. Is it's, it's very difficult to work out what sort of pricing works, and should you be explicit about pricing? Should you do what a lot of companies do and hide pricing? We decided to make it really easy because we were so small. I mean, for the first two years of Bosuma, we were three people, um, service and clients. So we didn't really want to talk to people in the sense we just didn't have the, everything was via Intercom was the system we used for customer support. So people would just um, log in via Intercom, record a query and we'd answer it. So I'd, I'd my answering queries, et cetera, because I was the only support person <laughs> right. we had at that time. Yeah. I didn't take telephone calls or anything like that. And also when people were buying, we just said, 
Well, these is completely free trial for a week or two. So you can test it, see if it does what you want. It, you just buy it online. You don't need to talk to us then because you've tried it. You know what the tool does. We don't have to explain it to you. We don't have to give you a sales demo particularly. You just try it if you like it at the end of the month, stick in your credit card. And so we didn't touch the customers. And that's the beauty of the internet in some ways these days is you can get those transactions going without you having too much cost, uh, um, which is an important part, really. Of course, we went to customers. The other thing we found was webinars. So suddenly I would run sort of two or three webinars a week about Basumo. And these groups, we'd have, you know, 200 people on every webinar, what I was talking about. So, and the great thing about it, like one-to-one, -one, you just chat to people, you explain things, you personality. Yep. As you come, sorts of things. And they could ask questions. We only ever let them ask questions in the room and then I'd re reply to them. Not so big, I had to have somebody sat on the stand me throwing out questions because I couldn't read the questions mm -hmm. flying through on one side. So, webinars were really useful for us to scale. But the biggest one, we had about 1,500 people just come on a webinar. Wow. And so, to reach 15 people in the old days as a consultant, I'd have to travel around the country, go to meetings. Oh, yeah. The costs would be huge. Whereas the webinars, <clears throat> we would use free versions, we would use Zoom. And suddenly we'd have to pay when we got more and more numbers, but it was a relatively low cost way of reaching people. So it was just a way of trying to scale, really. And mm. people seemed to like that. And then what we did was we ran webinars with other influencers. So, mm. um, so if somebody was uh, also doing something, so um, Lee Odom was doing stuff on content marketing, we said, right, why don't we run a joint webinar? And that was great because his audience and it leveraged our audience. We got a much bigger audience. Did that every month we ran one with somebody else who had an audience in the content marketing space. Um, and that was great. We ran them with HubSpot. Um, so difficult to because they're now so huge and a real success story. But they were keen to do web. And the way we did them was we, we did research for them. And we researched, but we really did all the research. So I did all the research, you know, what, what are people saying, what headlines were. I would do all that research. And then we'd push it out as a joint work. We did one when I approached Rand at, at Moz, who was very big uh, at that time. Um, he said, I'd be really interested. Is there a correlation between content that gets links and content that gets shared? So I said, well, I'm happy to do the research. So I spent about two months going through all the data using their, their database report. It went out. Really, it's a joint consumer, but I didn't mind that. And, and we had some good input from them, to be fair, as well. But because their audience was huge and ours was small, <laughs> and, yeah. and suddenly it got us known. There was a joint, a joint Moz by similar report. And I did the same with, with, with uh, Jason that's um, LinkedIn. So he ran the LinkedIn content marketing team, and we did a joint report with LinkedIn. And I think you'll know the company by the company you keep. Um, yep and to work with people who had good brands, good names, and, but we would do all of them to make it, um, you know, interesting for them. And, you know, um, we would do the work. So I would always do free research. I mean, when I approached in base of, you know, what can I do to help you? Can I research? Would you like free, et cetera? So I'd often do free research for people and give them free data. Um, build the relationship that way. You start by thinking about what's in it for them, not mm -hmm. what's in it for you. Yep. And further down the line, you can do a joint report or a joint webinar and that profile. So, but Sumo went from sort of nothing to being really quite well known in the social media from three guys, as we were guys at that time, who never worked in social media. We knew nothing really about social media, but we had to get to know the industry um, yep. and get to the industry and build our brand and reputation. And, I think when you're building, you've got to think about what you're really doing is building a brand. Because when people buy you, they normally want to buy the brand. I mean, unless you're building very specific technology, they want your brand and reputation and things like that. So mm -hmm. I always start by the first thing I do is find a decent name that you can trademark. Can you trademark it not just in your country, but can you trademark it in the US? Right. Can you trademark it in Australia, et cetera? Because if you can't, most people are going to want to take your business globally. I mean, Businesses are generally global these days, and maybe yep. not if you've got a small cake shop or something, but a software business is global the day you launch. Buzzsumo was global the day we, we mm -hmm. launched it. Um, so we trademarked the Buzzsumo name in the US, et cetera, in Europe. Um, and it's really important. I see people who set up their, their consultancy as agility or something, which works fine if you're just working in Brighton in the UK. 
but as soon as you try to go global, your brand isn't going to work. So you're building a brand. So you've got to think about all those things about how you build and protect the brand. Um, and that's something I've learned because I've always been trying to build businesses, which I know in three, four, five years, we're going to sell. And assuming we sold it after about three and a half years. Yep. So I sold it for just under $20 million. So it's a good little piece of work for us. Um, but that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to start businesses, build a brand, because I think I'm good at those bits and getting us known. But then I don't want to take on that. We if we were going to grow Basuma, we'd suddenly need 50 salespeople who are then starting to ring the big corporates, et cetera. Yep. I don't want to manage a team of 50 salespeople or just any large teams, really. It's not my skill set. I'm not good at it. Um, and I think you have to recognize what you're good at and what yep. you're not good at. And for me, I'm not good at managing that. And it does inspire me managing people. I think they call it a soft skill. Managing people is really hard. You know, like, why did you, <laughs> okay, why did, you do this? Yeah. Um, and I'm not good at it because I also, I'm a, I'm a terrible person in a way because if you're starting a business, it, it's a hard thing, but I think you have to be 24 seven. I think when you set up the sumo, you drive it, you drive it. You know, if you're going to beat the competition, you do have to stay up later to the competition. You have to do more. You have to write more mm -hmm. blog posts, et cetera. And there's always marketing that you can do every day. You can do more and more marketing. You'll know this. I mean, but you can do more marketing every single day. You can post to this forum, post to that forum, uh, try and run a webinar here, approach this person. Um, and it's terrible for your family. And I, reflecting back on it is, it's really tough on your family because people say work-life balance. There's not too much work-life balance when you're starting a business because you're trying to grow it and drive it. Um, and I keep thinking, is there a better way of doing this? And that, but if I'm honest, I think it is 24 seven, you can take some time, but, mm -hmm. and I would always set it up with other people um, because I think you then get their support. I mean, in any business, the other thing is that things go wrong. So things will always go wrong. So that's, that's not necessarily a problem. The problem is you know, if you don't put it right. So as long as you put it right, that's great. Some of my best customers have been things that went wrong. We put it right quickly. Yep. I flew to see them or whatever. Um, and that's great. Um, so things go wrong. And I think if you have two or three people, I've always had two or three people at least with me when I started the business, you have people who can share that burden, share yes. oh God, what's happening, et cetera. Um, being on your own, I think would be tough, at least for me. I think one of the skills you need as an entrepreneur, of course, is resilience. Yes. So you have to be resilient. Stuff goes wrong. You get problems with cash flow. I know what I've had to go around and borrow money from people to try and keep us afloat in cash flow terms, even if it's only for a few months. It's, you know, it's tough, really. But you have to work very hard, I think. And I, that could be hard if you, if you want work-life balance, if you've got young kids. I mean, I started my business later in life, and I think I was lucky. My teenage kids probably suffered a bit, I'll never tell you, <laughs> as a consequence. But... I think if you're starting with young kids, kids, I think it's a tough space. It's, it's hard work. There's no, that's the other thing I've learned. There's, there's no easy route. It's just hard graft, really. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's like Tony Jacklin quote, you know, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. It's, yeah. it's you just work um, very hard, I think. And so, yeah, if, you, if, you were, if you've got a young family at the moment, you think of starting a business, it's tough. But as a consequence, because I'm doing that all the time, I make a terrible manager. My wife once chastised me, probably rightly, we had a, a new IT guy in and on the Saturday morning, as what, something on our site went down. I forget what it was now, but it, for me, it was really important. So I mailed the IT guy by Saturday afternoon tea time. I'm going furious because he hasn't replied to me. And yes. so I'm saying to Chris, my wife, he hasn't replied. You know, this is so critical. We're a small business. We can't have this down. Um, and she's saying, look, he's just an employee. He's not you. And she was right, of course. But yeah. I'd be quite a hard taskmaster because for me, it's like, it's, I don't care if it's down on a Sunday evening or a Saturday evening. We're a small business. We've got customers globally, you know, so it might be Sunday, but they're working in Israel on Sunday. You know, it's, um, <laughs> you, know, and, you, know, it, you know, it might be two in the morning, but people in Australia are up, so the site can't be down. If the site goes down and you get a ping on the phone, you've got to put that back up. Um, so I think you have to be quite driven. At least this is my view. And I mean, in some ways, I hope I'm wrong because that means that you can't get a good balance <laughs> when you're starting a business. But I think those first two or three years when you're really driving, really building the brand is just a lot of hard graft and a lot of hours. Um, I mean, unless you're very lucky or something, but I, in my experience, that's what it is. It's a lot of hard graft. It's a lot of work. Um, and so, yeah, if you think about saving a business, I do think there's never been a better time. You could set up a brand and a business. Now we can put up a WordPress website, you know, next week, we can have all the infrastructure set up next week. We can get you know, Amazon Web Services up. We can get Intercom set up. 
um, it, you can look like a big business very quickly online. Yes. You can start building the brand. So the internet gives you that potential, but there can't have ever been a better time to build a business. At Buzz Sigma, we're three guys. We have customers in Argentina, Australia, you know, China, all over the place. Um, and we can deal with them. Even I was writing emails back in Spanish and my Spanish is terrible, but I have Google Translate. So they'd send me messages in Spanish. I'd stick it into Google Translate. I'd write a reply. I'd send it back again. Um, and we just carry on managing the business that way. It's, um, so the tools you have, it's fantastic. I mean, it really is fantastic. And I still think there are loads of opportunities. A lot of the big opportunities leave to the big companies, but there are lots of point solutions. Um, and I suppose, um, you know, Buffer did this on a sharing tool. There are lots of really simple little tools that you can build that make people's lives easier. And you can build those up. You can then sell that company for $10, $20 million. So it's a good little business for you. Yeah, IBM's not interested in that. Other companies, LinkedIn's not interested in that at the small scale. But you can build something and then sell it on. And so I think always look at you know, what are the simple things that make people's lives easier. I really like a little tool called Satismeter. And it runs on the net promoter score. So people just rate you from one to 10. Yep. Would, you recommend, would you recommend us to a friend or a colleague one to 10? And basically you can keep track of your scores. And we did that on Bussumo all the time. So all the time I'm looking at how are people rating us? Is it going up? Is it going down? They build wow, a little okay. tool, a little bit of JavaScript sits on your site. It pops up. You pay $90 a month for it. They're probably making lots of money off of it. But for me, it was worth the $90. Um, and it, it just met that one need. So every time you go on Buzzsumo, you may have had it. Up pops the little tool. It says, you know, would you recommend us? That's it, really. But that gave me so much feedback and information. So there are always opportunities, I think, for these small little tools that people haven't found yet. Um, and they're, they're relatively easy to build. You're not building big, complex corporate software. Mm -hmm. You're building point tools, really. Like Buzzsumo is not big, complex software in a way. It's, it's a lot of servers, handy with criticizing, <laughs> lots of servers running in the background, they're hard yeah. to manage doing the crawling. Um, but at the front end, the software's not uh, super complicated. Um, so I think there are loads of opportunities for people. So in that sense, I'd like to encourage people because it, it's fantastic, the opportunities out there. Yeah. But it's hard work. Yeah. Now, uh, there's one thing that um, uh, I've been, uh, I'm curious about in terms of a lot of times you build a platform and you build a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of features. So um, there's a great book out there, you know, which talks about minimal viable product, okay, yeah. the lean startup, okay. Now, that book talks about the MVP, minimal viable yeah. product. So what was your journey in terms of how many features do I build into BuzzSumo to make it a minimal viable product? Yeah. And tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, so I suppose we did do that. We started with a minimal viable product, which was doing what we saw the basics, which is people are really interested in their areas about what's being shared. So I want to type in a topic like e-learning. What, what's the most shared content this week? Um, what's sort of trending? Mm -hmm. it, something you don't really see from Google, for example. So, um, so we thought people were interested in that. So we built a really basic. So at the start, it was just you type in a topic and we show you the most shared content on that topic. Wow. That was it really. Yep. That was our minimum viable product. Um, and people liked it. And then we started adding more of the whistles about, so okay, so who shared it and those sorts of things. And then we started saying, well, could we get data on how many links does that have as well? So we can not only see how many shared, but how many links did it get? Or could we add LinkedIn to that? Or could we add Reddit shares? So we gradually added features. We had, we had requests for new features from clients all the time. And I think you've got to be really careful and resist them. <laughs> yes. um, and so we were, we were, we were uh, some features we built which didn't work, but generally, we built them if a, if a big client wanted it and we felt that it would be beneficial to other clients. Um, so our, all of our trending feature really came from a request from Buzzfeed. Buzzfeed was saying, this is great, Steve. And I can see what was the most shared content yesterday because we, we allow people to do it by time yesterday, the week, etc. Yep. And they said, but I really was interested in what was the most shared content three hour in the last three hours. Because right. a, week, a day is too old. So yes. We then built the trending feature, which shows you what was the most shared content today. And you can go down to the last hour. So if you want to type in e-learning in BuzzSumo now um, or coronavirus, you can see the most shared content in the last hour. Yep. And that feature, that whole trending feature, came out of a request from, from BuzzFeed. But we did build some other features which didn't really work, really. I mean, and to be honest, the main money still comes from that core MVP, MVP feature that we built. Yep. Um, but we did realize as we started getting new customers like BuzzFeed, we needed new features 
because they were a different type of client. We hadn't really thought about them as a client. Yeah. And to be honest, we hadn't really worked in publishing, so we didn't really know what they wanted. So I, every time we got a big customer sign up like BuzzFeed, I offered to go and train them, which normally we would just do on a webinar or train yourself. It's going to be easy to use. Yeah. Um, but for those big customers, I offered training sessions. So I actually then went to the travel to their offices, but it wasn't so much to train them, it was to ask them about their problems and what were they struggling with, et cetera. What did they need? Yeah. Just so that we could really understand our customers because we thought we understood small marketers, but we didn't really understand these big publishers. And so suddenly we had these very big publishers coming online. So I would go and see them. So I spent time with the Daily Telegraph in the UK, et cetera, a BuzzFeed in New York, and I would try to really understand what their business was. Um, so I would listen to them and then decide whether we wanted to build things out. But I do think you have to be careful on how much you build out. You don't want too many whistles and bells. And the other thing I think, if you're building the sort of product I'm talking about, is it's got to be simple to use. <clears throat> the nice thing about Buzzsumo is it's just a search box. Mm -hmm. Most people know how to use a search box. Well, actually they don't because they don't use the more advanced features. They just tend to put something in a search box. <laughs> but it, it's familiar. It's a familiar interface and people can use it. Um, and so you know, nobody says, I need training on how to use Google. You, mm -hmm. know, you work it out. It's, it's fairly intuitive. Um, and almost if you need lots of training, that's almost a failure of the product design in some ways. Um, yeah. And often if you're a big corporate product, you need that and you need to train people. But for us, we need to keep it really simple so it's easy to use. We did put support videos online, help online. I would run webinars to take people through how to do it. So I run webinars on how to do specific things, like how to use Buzzsumo to find influencers in your field, mm -hmm. you know, how to use Buzzsumo to find the headlines that work in your space. Yep. Um, so I would run specific types of webinars and I would often get hundreds of people come on to those. Um, but the core product I think has to be really easy to use because I think for me it's about minimum viable product and I, I agree with lots of the stuff in the lean startup. I think that's what we were. Um, but I think there's something about what I would call speed to value. How long do I have to use this product before I get value out of it? Yes. And most people want that to be almost straight away. <laughs> yes. Um, there are some products, um, and I've tried to use some of these really big data analysis products um, because I love analyzing data. Um, but sometimes it says, oh, well, you need to really do a week's training before you can get stuff out of it. And for me, it doesn't work for me. I'm not a sort of person I can spend a week learning a product before I get value out of it. Yep. So I think speed to value if you're a small product is quite important. How quickly can somebody get real value? And I think what we showed with BuzzSumo was that you type in a, you type in a topic and you instantly got results. So, it was almost, we don't want to tell you what we do. When you went to the BuzzSumo website, I think it's still the same now. We could have lots of stuff saying, this is about the product, these are the people who use it. But we started with a search box saying, type something in. Because yep. once you type something in, you'll see the value we deliver. So rather than tell you about it, let's just show you. And I think show, not tell is a really important feature. So just type something into that search box, you'll see the value. Hopefully you'll then get the product. Whereas we could spend pages trying to explain that to you. It doesn't work. So we just wanted to get people into the product. And so once you're in, it's saying, okay, now just subscribe for a free trial. You can carry on using it. So you've got to make it really simple because it, it can be a really small barrier. It can be a really tiny barrier and people won't use your product. Yeah. So it's got to be really easy to use. So to me, a small product's got to be about speed to value. I really love that term, actually, Steve. I I've never heard it before. And uh, I'm sure listeners are going to be taking notes on speed to value now. <laughs> um, so maybe that's, um, what's the speed to value? Uh, STV. Okay, maybe that's a new term we should be using now. Okay, STV, speed to value. So um, I, I think one of your superpowers in listening to you and as we've talked over the years is that you have a real knack I suppose, one, simplifying, which I think is really, really important. Number two, um, I think uh, you understand that you are just trying to solve a problem. So you're, and this is what's interesting when you talked about, you know, you went over to see, you know, Buzz Sumo, and you're going, okay, I'm not training you. Actually, what are your biggest problems? How can I solve them? And I think that's what you seem to have done, especially with Buzz Sumo, is how can I solve a problem? How can I make it as simple as possible? And on top of that, how can I make it speed to values so that they can identify the value they're going to get within seconds? I think that's pretty, 
I'd, I'd call that a superpower, Steve. I think it's uh, pretty amazing. Now, yeah, I'm not sure it's super. Lots of hard work to do it, but fundamentally, you do have to solve customer problems. I mean, your your product right. has to solve a customer problem. Yeah, that's the core of it. Yeah, and I think you know whether it's whether you're writing a blog or whatever, it's actually trying to get to the heart of uh, what. Um, is the customer's biggest pain points and how can you actually answer them whether you it's whether it's via a video or whether it's via text now what i just one of the other things i want to ask you too was was there any mentors or resources along the way that sort of helped you uh, inspired you um on the journey um yeah in, in terms of books the one book i always quote and i feel it's incredibly valuable there's a little book thin volume called love is the killer app um, yep. and it, quite old now it's probably the best part of 20 years old um and it, what it really says is you know give away your knowledge your value just give it away to people so whether you're at meetings take the time to give it to people give it away on your website give it away on your blog give away your knowledge because that then gets returned to you that love yes. comes back basically yep. um and i'm a great believer in that i mean i i hate websites that just say our tool is fantastic because it does this i mean uh, ours would be how to write a headline you know how to yep. to work with an influencer try to to write blog posts which have value and give away all your knowledge and some people would say to us you're mad you're giving away so yes. much knowledge here um yep. you should be charging people for this but i don't agree with that i mean obviously in my business if i'm a consultant maybe it's slightly different but um that's not our business so i want to give away all that knowledge because that builds your brand we want to be a brand that seems yep. to help people and if, if someone's got a problem i genuinely would go out of my way to try and help them i would try and set aside an hour to look at their problem um, I try to help as many people as I can and I try to provide value. I try to share what I've learned. Um, so I'm not trying to hide it away and get people to pay for anything. It's just give it away really. Um, and so I, I think that little slim volume on, on love is the killer app. Um, it sounds counterintuitive to lots of people, but yes. for me, it's just you're most, you, you're the best knowledge you have. Uh, just give it away to other people and yep. be helpful to other people, you know, really love other people, give, give them help. They're building a business you know, help them grow it, do yep. what you can to, to help them yep. because you know, you never know in 10 years time that can come back, etc. So, um, for me, there are lots of business books like, um, the lean startup and you know, all that stuff of crossing the chasm and things. There are lots of business books. One book, if you're doing a services business, I would recommend people buy is called, it's called, I think it's called managing the professional service firm. Mm -hmm. And it, it was actually written by a lawyer about managing a legal practice. I think, but if you're managing a services business where you're really selling people's time, albeit packaged as projects, et cetera, it's a great book about what's the key things you need to do when you're managing a professional services firm. Yep. Um, and it gets to the nub of it really quickly about, you know, you think like, you know, in e-learning, we thought we were e-learning experts, but really we needed to be experts in buying and selling people because that's the core of our business model. We bought people at one price, we sold them at another price and yep. we had to keep them utilized in between. So, it got to the nub of what are the really key things you need to track. There are only so many things in any business you need to track. So in a services business, you have to track utilization every Monday morning. What's the utilization? Who's on what utilization? Are we maximizing it? Have we maxed out people's plans for this week? Yep. If you're in a product business like we were, churn. Churn was really important. Are people you know, paying for the product and then stopping paying for it? Churn will kill your business. Yes. Mathematically, churn just kills your business. So you've got to really keep churn as low as you can. So it would be every day on that case, what's the churn, et cetera, not mm -hmm. just what's the growth rate, et cetera, but what's the churn of the business and how are we growing that? So in any business, it's getting down to those, those key things and the professional, managing the professional service firm was a really good book for that. So they're two books that I suppose uh, have, have inspired me in terms of the way we run okay. a business. I also like the exponential business because I think that's what small products can do now. You can suddenly build a very small product, whether it's something like a buffer or something like a, a Buzzsumo or what I call status meter, suddenly you can, there's an audience of millions for those tools. So you can yep. suddenly scale it hugely. And once you're past break even, and that's what I like about small businesses. I mean, even at the point we sold Buzzsumo, we were only eight people. So that's a lean startup. Mm -hmm. um, but because we only had eight people, we were very profitable. So yeah, I'm happy to reel the numbers because they're old now. But you know, when we sold Buzzsumo, we were doing just $6 million of revenues but we were doing over $3 million in net profit a year yep. because we were a small lean business. It was mainly servers and us. Um, yep. And we kept it really small. We didn't have a marketing team. We weren't spending on advertising. Um, so yeah, that's important. I think. 
Yeah. And that actually then brings up the point of, and one of the things I love about um, uh, the internet and the digital world we live in, and, and as you said, scalable businesses, it can be exponential, is that uh, software as a service companies, which is what you built at uh, BuzzSumo, uh, essentially are incredibly profitable, get high gross profit. So, um, and that's, you know, software as a service type companies. And you just said you're turning over $6 million, but $3 million profit. You're like, that's almost unheard of in terms of a company with only eight people. If you were trying to do that with a services company, that's just not going to be, um, you just yeah. won't be able to do it. Yeah. You can only sell eight people's time. So, and then you've got to pay the eight people. So you're only ever making a markup on the people that you're paying. So it's, it's a different type of business. And that's why having built up and sold Kineo, we, we sold it for good money, et cetera. But I thought, no, this, this is hard business. There's got to be businesses. And so then, that's yeah. when I researched product business. And so I switched completely from, running a service-based business to a product-based business. And yeah. my preference as a small startup entrepreneur would be to run the product-based business. There are different risks because you have to build the product first. Yes. That takes time and money and you may then not get any buyers. But I think one of my lessons would be, like we do with Basuma, get a beta out there straight away. If you're building something small, just get a beta out there because you get feedback straight away. So we knew Basuma was working because suddenly we've got loads of beta users and they're giving us great feedback. Yep. Whereas if we built it in secret and then launched it, you don't know. and there is a danger if you build something in beta, people copy you. And people did copy Bersuma, lots of people copied us. But my view is we just have to keep moving. And that's another sort of thing. I think if you're building a product, you do have to keep moving because even if you're on the right track, someone's going to come and run you over if you don't move fast enough. So yeah. you do have to move quite quickly. So my view is it doesn't matter that people are coming and copying Bersuma because we've got the ideas, we're moving ahead of the game, et cetera. So they're always slightly behind us. Yep. Um, so there is a danger with, with betas that people copy, but you have to be confident in your abilities and your innovation and, and be able to keep moving. So, yep. um, but yeah, get that beta out there quickly to know because it's, it's high risk being a, a product yep. business. Yeah, it's interesting watching uh, you know, technology companies and uh, whether big or small. And one thing I certainly have noticed, which is what you became aware of quite quickly, was that you're actually like in an arms race. And the arms race, number one, is actually to build a product quickly and keep innovating, which is what you were yep. doing. And number two, you're actually uh, not only that's one part of the arms race, which is the technology arms race. In other words, constant development software, because you're building a software tech company. The other one is actually getting that distribution and marketing, isn't it? Getting that reach globally. So that's yeah. the other part to the equation of the arms race in this global digital entrepreneurship model that has emerged um, and is challenging all of us. Yeah, at the end... Yeah, so I think the product is arguably the most important point because if you've got a bad product, it doesn't matter what your marketing's like. So the product has to work. So you've got to spend a lot of your money on the product. And I think some people spend more on marketing than the product. And for us, it was about the product. I mean, there were three okay. of us. I did the marketing and management and, and Henley and James did the product, really. So you need that. But yeah, I mean, you just need to build that brand. And I think the, the, the key about that is that it's just, it's a lot of work. It's, if you're not paying for lots of advertising, basically I was going to every forum I could find saying, here's Basuma, there's a free version. I mean, every forum. I would spend three hours wow. in an evening just posting to 300 forums, um, for example. Wow. Um, and probably 99% of that didn't work, but maybe 1% of it worked. Yep. I would be writing to influencers. And I wasn't just writing a lot of the standard mails. It would be, is there some research? I mean, we've got all this data. We do have tons of data on the most shared content. Is there any research I can do for you which would be helpful? Um, yep. So I would, I'd approach them in, in that way. I would send them articles which I thought were, were interesting, et cetera. I would try to go to meet them. I went to conferences primarily to meet influencers, like when I met you, rather than necessarily to speak, because you want to meet people. Yep. Um, because I'd say, oh, I've been following your stuff. I liked your stuff. You see, I um, you know, shared that or whatever. Um, but you get to know them, really. And hopefully you get to know them. You'll, you do become friends with lots of those people. Um, but you want to meet people in person. So there's only so much you can do online. Yes. You can't meet all your customers, but you can meet some of the key players. And the easiest way is to go to social media marketing conference or whatever those big conferences are yep. and, and meet people. But yeah, but the marketing really is important. But I think it's building the brand, so I think handling a distinctive brand sort of image, having good content. So, I mean, we were writing, I was writing, you know, blog posts every day. So you write, you're going to do regular content because there's so much competition in the world. If you stop doing something, for two or three weeks, people forget about you in a way. It's just, that's rough. <laughs> it's just um, so it is relentless. And I think that's my other thing about running a startup business until you get to a certain point, 
you just got to be relentless. It's nonstop. It's relentless. It's relentless. It's okay. I've posted into these forums, you know, I've written this article. I mean, I've appeared on um, probably less than you, but probably hundreds of podcasts because people would mail me and say, would you be on a podcast? And I just say yes to everything. Yes. I'll go on your podcast. <laughs> okay. When, when you're, when you're marketing a product, you have to, I mean, now I don't do them anymore because I'm not trying to market anything, but when, when you're on Persimmon, you're growing the product. I just say yes to everybody. So do this interview. Would you give me 10 tips? I hate all that stuff as an influencer, but I would just do it because it's just, we just need the Bersumo yeah. name everywhere. Um, and that was our aim was just to saturate the market. So, and I think we did get to that point where you say to people, Bersumo, I also remember a friend of mine came over from New Zealand um, and he was chatting to his brother in the car driving to me. So I'm seeing Steve, he's at this company called Bersumo and his brother in the car said, oh, we use Bersumo. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> okay. I think that's the sign that you're out there. You've made, you've made it in a way. You, the name, with the name yeah. got big and I think, Unfortunately, I think it's not being done as much now um, as when I was there because you, you are just driving it all the time. And I think the other thing I'd say is if you're a small lean company, this applies to both the people doing the marketing, but also the people doing the product development is just recruit the very, very best people you can find. Mm -hmm. Because in my view, a good person is not just worth two people. A good person is worth 10 to 20 people. Right. And I'm serious about that. I think they really are a good developer is worth 10 developers. So it's yes. worth paying double yep. the price for a good developer because they're worth 10 developers. And somebody who really drives and has got that sort of motivation is worth 10 other people on marketing. And, mm. and so my view is you keep it small, but you have a really high energy um, team who are running quite hard, really. So, mm. and I think that's the way you, you have to do it. Um, but yeah, but simple things like, you know, if, if it's risky developing a product, do a beta version quickly. And I think... <laughs> I think it's there's that old simple rule of fail quickly. If it's not going to work, get it to fail quickly and move on probably. Um, yeah. Because otherwise you can spend a lot of time. And I think, I mean, I have um, been involved in other businesses and, um, you know, I haven't sold all of them, and so, but I've sold the most of them. But, but sometimes you think, actually, it's not going to work. And then you yep. have to make a decision quite quickly. That's not going to work. And maybe somebody else is keen on running it. And so a few of those businesses I've passed on to other people who would like the business and they want to make them grow. But I'm thinking I don't, I think it's it's there so yep. Yep. um so to move that that on really um yep. because i think you know content marketing much better than i do and it's it's about being relentless and it just builds over time there's no big bang in my view no there's, there's not no big it's... bang so you just write blog posts for you know and, and occasionally people said well i want to write a couple of blog posts and i want them to go viral and say well it doesn't work like that if no. you just write really good content and share really good stuff for the next year then maybe one of your pieces will <laughs> that's right exactly but you've got to keep going, keep going, and it, and the, and it just goes up gradually. You're, you're, in my experience, the, the, the website visitors went up you know, quite fast, but consistently um, over time. Yeah. And I think it's based on, you know, and to give away content, you've got to give away everything you know, you know all your my secret knowledge, give it away, because otherwise you've got to prove that you're giving away stuff that's valuable to people. Yeah, so, and, that, and that was one of the biggest, one of the uh, most conversations I think I had was people going, just giving everything away. And I went, yes, but what happens is when you give it away, actually what happens is the world shows up and gives it back to you. And yeah. I think that, you know, the book you mentioned, Love is you know, the killer app, I think is just, uh, I'm, I'm going to go and download it after we finish here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's I, a slim little yeah. book, but the, yeah, the yeah. principles are very simple. Yeah. But I think, I mean, I'd say that, I think the other thing is, I talked about Satismeter, which is the tool we use, but I think you've got to track customer feedback. So, you know, we had on our site a little pop-up all the time saying, how would you rate us from one to 10? And I track that religiously. And, and felt sick in my stomach if someone rated us a three or something. I mean, I literally did it was like a body blow. So what's the name of the app? Satisfy me? Um, or? Um, uh, this was called, um, I, I assume it's still going, this, we used it a few years ago. It's called Satismeter. S-A-T-I-S meter. Satismeter. Okay. okay. And you just install it on your product um, site. Um, there are others you can use. Um, and I think the NPS score is, net promoter score is really important. Basically, people have to rate you from one to ten. You know, would they recommend you? And really, if they're not rating you nine or 10, they're really never going to recommend you. That's the yeah. bottom line. Um, yeah. And so you want to see what your, your average scores are. And you can, you can track them um, over time. So you know, score over 50 generally is good. You work out the scores and see yeah. all that stuff online. But I would track it every day. What are people scoring us? And we had underneath us, you could rate us and then you could add a comment. Most people didn't. But where people added comments, if they made a critical comment, I would look at it and make sure, are they right? Should we change that, et cetera? So every single day I was listening to customers. So I couldn't talk to them every day, but by using a tool like that, 
And because we had so many users, yep. I was getting quite a lot of feedback. So every day I'm getting hundreds of these giving feedback that I can keep an eye on really. Yeah, so great. you've got to keep listening to, the, to those customers and make sure they're happy with it because the last thing you want is churn. Yep. Now it was interesting too, you mentioned that um, you uh, basically failed quickly and if it didn't work, you actually didn't do it anymore. Um, I was uh, listening to an interview with Gary Keller from um, the One Thing book fame. And he said that he, is, he has a tactic of what he calls red light, green light. In other words, uh, if something's working green, he just goes for it. If it's actually not working, it's a red light, he just stops doing it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, when I heard that, I went, wow, that is such a cool but simple way to live life um, yeah. and, and, and to work in business. Yeah, and I think it's critical, really, because we occasionally we added features and then they weren't really working. We'd say, oh, maybe because we haven't marketed them right or we haven't told people exactly what they're doing. We haven't shown people quite how to use them. So we were coming up for lots of excuses why that feature wasn't quite working. And you, because you spent a bit of time investing on it, you try to say, oh, let's try and make it work. But in reality, it's just not working. <laughs> so um, yeah. it's a painful lesson, but it's like, okay, but it's easier to, to, move, to move off of that, really. So yeah. so, yeah, that's something I would learn. I mean, the other thing I'd say is, you know, I'm a relatively old guy now in this, in this game, um, but you just keep learning. I mean, that's my other thing. Is that yep. the, the other principle I learned is that everybody can become obsolete. And with the pace of change these days, we can now all become obsolete faster than we could ever become obsolete that's right. before. <laughs> that's um, right. so, so you have to keep learning every day. So my wife still has Chris has heard me about how much I read, but it's like, but if I'm not up with what's happening, she said, why are you playing with TikTok? Why are you playing with these things? So I just need to know what's happening really. Exactly. Um, yep. And, the question I think everyone has to ask themselves is, and I always say to this, when I've been running teams, I always say to them, you know, are your skills and experience more valuable today than they were last yep. year? Yep. Because if they're not, you're becoming obsolete. Very you, quickly. You need to be investing yep. in yourself. So, um, so think, you think about it. Are, are your skills more valuable now than they were a month ago? Or are you less valuable? Because if you're going to be selling your skills to people, they need to stay valuable, really. So um, I think you know, nobody knows everything. You got to keep learning from as many people as you can, really. But for me, it's just about learning every day. So I set aside time every day just to, to just browse, just to see what's going on, yep. read some forums, etc. read things I don't normally read, um, just to try and keep stuff. And, and that's, I do use Twitter lists and I find them incredibly valuable. Twitter can be frustrating, but I have about 10 lists and I have different people in different lists and I skim the lists, really. And because I think if there's anything interesting happening in this space, then these 20 people are going to know about yep. it and tell me about it. Okay. If there's anything interesting in this space, this is another 10 people. So I have one like for politics. So if there's anything happening in labor politics or something in, in the UK, I've got a list of people with, you know, if it's happening, they'll probably tell me about it. So I use them as my little monitors. So I try to use people on yep. Twitter as people who've got their fingers out there telling me what's going on. On the pulse, yeah. Um, yeah, because we, we need, we, we all have to keep learning really. So it's, you know, my, my dad, um, you know, he trained as a carpenter. And his skill set really saw him through most of his life. But that doesn't happen to us now. No, <laughs> yeah, no, so, you know, so suddenly you're just learning everything. I mean, I was trying to explain to my kids, you know, I started work in the 80s. You know, we never had computers. I mean, I was in the office when the first IBM PC arrived. It was like, wow, what is mm -hmm. this thing? You know, and that was way before the internet. And then later we had the internet, et cetera. Um, things have changed so much. And they would just continue to change now and change probably mm -hmm. even faster. So, um, you know, yes, you use email, but Slack is so much faster. So you, you, you know, things just keep moving on all the time. So we have to keep learning and it's, it's hard work. And that's why I say starting a business, it's a relentless process. It, there's no mm. easy, easy way to it really, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's no secret. It's a lot of hard graph. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah. So in, well, what, what are maybe some of the biggest challenges you've had uh, as you uh, started and grew these businesses, Steve? Um, I think the couple of things that I mentioned really, I think firstly, things go wrong. And I think the question is about being resilient. So things will go wrong. Clients get upset, projects go wrong, et yep. cetera. Um, um, you bill somebody for more than you should do. Whatever happens, it is stuff goes wrong and you have to, to be resilient. So the first thing is you must expect problems. You must expect challenges yep. to arise and you can deal them with saying, okay, that's fine. We're going to deal with it this way. Or you can be negative and down. And to me, mm -hmm. that's why I've always had people around me to help me to keep up really. Um, so I think understanding that things go wrong is important, but and so whatever challenge comes, you know it's coming mm -hmm. and you know stuff will go wrong. You have to sort it out. Um, the other stuff that's difficult, I mean, I think there are lots of things about managing a business that are difficult, like managing cash flow and things. I mean, it's, yes. um, um, you know, 
and to me, you've got to know what things cost um, in terms of you producing it, so how much time you're spending on things. Um, but you've got to manage cash flow. And yeah, I've learned that the hard way. You've really got to keep a tight rein on, on cash to keep that, that business uh, moving. Um, so yeah, managing cash is a, a critical challenge, I think, for, for any small business, particularly if you're bootstrapping the business like I was. So yep. you know, you're just the person putting the money in. So um, that, that's a key, a key challenge uh, for you, I think. Um, so I'm trying to think of others. I mean, there are so many challenges. I suppose the other challenge is, I suppose, just maintaining your mental health and fitness if you're going to start a business. Yep. So hopefully you got the sense from what I'm saying. If you start a business, it's hard work. Yep. And you have to look after yourself during that hard work. And you have to look at yourself mentally and physically. So for me, I still found time to go to the gym every day. I love going to the gym, et cetera. I'm trying to, the heavier the weights I did, the more endorphins or whatever kicked in uh, to keep me going. But I've always slept well. I've always had a view that if I wake up at night thinking about work, I'm going to give it up because it's not worth it. So I always sleep well and I always try to get good, solid sleep, et cetera. But I think if you're an entrepreneur, it is such relentless drive. So I would work probably 16 hours a day, 14 hours a day. Um, but you have to look after yourself. So you have to recognize that that's what you're doing. Yep. And so you have to recognize those things. I mean, having a family helps. And I had an older family when I set it up. So because they take you away from it. So that's quite yep. good. And they bring you back to reality quite a lot. Yes. Um, I, I wish I'd been a better father during it. I wish I'd understood a few more things. Um, around that but equally i think if you're setting up a business and it's a bootstrap startup business it is just a hard drive um mm -hmm. to get it going you can try to build lifestyle businesses but i'm generally of the view that most businesses are either growing or declining mm -hmm. um it's very rare to have a steady state business i mean they do exist there are small mom and pop shop type businesses but generally in our game if you're a software product you're either growing or you're falling yeah. and so you know, you've got to be relentless to keep it growing, really. Um, but I would say the challenge is then keeping some balance with your family, some balance with your partner, uh, with your kids. Did you have a morning it, routine? Did you have a morning routine? That, well, uh, my, my problem is I had a, I was probably too selfish. I had a morning routine for me. Yes. To keep me healthy. I would, can, I would you go, tell, can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, well, I would, morning routine for me was, I mean, I'd make sure I got sleep, but, I would exercise in the morning. So I would set outside time each morning mm -hmm. before I started work to, to exercise, for example. But that was really time for me, not time for the family <laughs> necessarily. And so I don't think I was a, a great dad in that sense. As I got older, I got slightly better at it. Um, but for me, it was making sure I had, for me, I would exercise every morning and then I'd have a decent breakfast, a good breakfast, okay. et cetera, fuel me up for the day because I see so many people don't eat properly, don't sleep properly, and that ultimately will lead to health issues, I think. Um, but also, I mean, I found it a positive stress. I love seeing the numbers go up, et cetera. So <laughs> yeah. it's stressful, but it's a positive, positive stress as well. But for me, it was about exercise, eating, and sleep. I mean, they're basic, really basic things. But I think if I had my time again, I would spend more time probably looking after the family than I did. Um, uh, I don't think I gave them enough time. I don't think I recognized the impact that I was having by being so relentlessly focused. So, yeah. you know, I would sit on the sofa at night. We'd watch TV together. But of course, I wasn't watching TV. I'm answering Slack queries. So someone's asking <laughs> about this and I'm saying, yeah. oh, yeah, you can get the demo here. Oh, yes, we wrote an article on that, et cetera. Um, and so I was there, but I wasn't present. You know, that sort of classic saying, yeah. you know, I, I was there in the room with Chris, but I wasn't present. I'm, I'm in a world of Slack and thinking about things or answering queries. Um, yes, the TV program's going on in front of me, et cetera. Um, yeah. I've got better at putting my phone away. I'm still not great at it, but I, you need time in the evenings. I've got a friend of mine who set his phone. It just goes off at seven in the evening. Now, I've still not quite managed that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it in the other room and then I'll go and check it periodically. Um, um, I don't have my phone by my bed. I charge it away from the bed, uh, either at the far end of the bedroom or in another room. So I don't have the phone in bed, et cetera. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, yep. But um, so I have some sort of routines there. But in respect, I, I should have done more to keep that, that balance together in terms of the family. I, think. Okay. I remember once I'd been in Chicago for about three or four days. I rang home and my daughter picked up the phone and we were chatting for a while. And she said, where are you? I said, I've been in Chicago for three days. Oh, I didn't realize you were away. It's like, 
<laughs> I've been away three days. My daughter hasn't even noticed I'm away. I'm away that often. Um, luckily, now you can work more from home and things. I mean, for Simmer, we, we ran it from home. And I was amazed how well that worked, really. With regular calls yeah. like this, we would have regular webinar calls. Slack, we're Slack chatting all the time, etc. You can do more work from home these days, which even in the last 10 years, that's just improved markedly. You can now really work from home in a way that you couldn't before. So mm -hmm. that, that will help you get a slightly better balance. You, you, I think you have to travel less. In my day, you had to get on a plane a lot. I mean, you've got more MRs than I have, but um, there's certain types of roles you have to get on a plane a lot. And that can be hard for the family and stuff. Yeah. Um, so a bit of balance. But equally, I've been thinking and thinking, is there, is there, is there an easier way of doing it? And I don't think there is. I think if you're starting a, a bootstrap startup business, yeah. you have to be 100% on it pushing it, driving it, um, you know, and I do think people say, say to me, well, you know, how did you, you do better than other people? And I said, I think I just stayed awake longer, probably. I'm just working <laughs> through till 11 a.m. in the evening, 11 p.m. in the evening, et cetera, answering the queries. I was writing to more forums, pushing more things. Hopefully you, you also have a, a much better product. And I'm sure some people will be very critical of me and say, well, sometimes you can have a great product and you have a really good um, quality of life and balance. And yeah. hopefully that's true for some businesses. And I'm sure I could have eased back a little bit, yeah. but I did feel that it's like marketing. You, know, you, you do so much stuff, you never know what stuff really works sometimes. Yeah. It can be hard to measure. It's so constant. you just do everything. So, you know, I meet and, and talk to, you know, I do 30 podcasts, let's say, over a month. And, you know, when I was at Persimo, and I never know, one of those might have been picked up. 29 of those might have been a complete waste of my time, but I, <laughs> I never quite knew what would, would be there. Yeah. And often people say, oh, I listen to you talk on X. So, um, it may just be that it's something about the way I manage and hopefully people yeah. will manage it. I suppose what I would hope is people manage it better than I do. Yeah. And so I'd at least ask people to be uh, cognitive of it, be conscious of it so that they, they're aware of these sorts of issues yeah. um, and think about ways to balance it. But yeah. it, it, it's hard. Yeah. yeah and the terms you keep bringing up all the time are relentless and persistence. And um, I totally identify with that. I remember the first four years of when, when we started jeffbullis.com was I got up at 4.30 a.m. before I started my day job until I finally left that and struck out you know, as, a, as a full, you know, grown-up business. Um, 4.30 a.m. till 9 a.m. each morning to actually create content. And then I didn't know what was going to work and what wasn't going to work, except yeah. just to keep trying. So um, relentless and persistence is certainly a big factor in, in success. So um, I'm aware of your time, uh, Steve. And I suppose just, just before we finish up here, um, What's one, you know, big thing you'd like to share that, uh, you know, takeaway that you'd like to share with our audience that uh, you think is really important in, in being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I would go back to that little book, Love is the Killer App. I would go back to it. It's basically treat people how you want to be treated, be a nice person and give away your knowledge. Just give away your knowledge because it's helpful to people to grow their businesses, help them as much as you can. So just basically help other people as much as you can help other people really. Um, and that will come back to you. May not come back to you tomorrow, next year, five years, 10 years. Um, but I think it's a way to live your life anyway. And it's just yeah, love it other people. Be careful of other people. Don't say harsh words of other people. I never criticize competition, et cetera, or say harsh words. There's no need for that. The world yeah. is a small place. We're only here once. Be nice to other people. Even be nice to competitors. It's Sometimes, and this can happen, it does happen in the States a bit more, I think people can be quite aggressive. Yes, sir. And, and to me, it's just, it's not necessary to be aggressive. There's a big space. We're all competing in this space. It's a big world. Um, so be nice to other people um, and be helpful to other people. Take time to help other people. And people respect you for that, I think. So, yep. yeah, I mean, that would be my one big lesson is, is read that book and just, just be a nice person. Help other people as much as you can. Yep. That, that's great wisdom and um, and it's been great getting to know you over the years, Steve, and uh, you've always been um, a gentleman that I've loved hanging out with and uh, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and experience and passion and uh, I look forward to catching up sometime, whether it's in London or Brighton or whether you... Yeah, yeah or Sydney. I'm just booking my flights over to Sydney next January. It's raining okay. so much here this January, I'm thinking... I'm definitely going to be down, <laughs> down in Australia and New Zealand next January. So I'll definitely see you down there next year. 
I'm looking forward to that, Steve. And thank you very much for, for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward to sharing um, your wisdom and your story and, and help other people. And just thank you very much for sharing your insights um, and giving so much away. I've really appreciated it. Thank you. No problems. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Steve. All right, we'll just stop there then. All right, I'm okay. not recording, but um, yeah, thanks, Steve. Really, really appreciate it, mate. And um, so good to see your smiling face again. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, no, it's good. It's good to see you. So yeah, no, I'm seriously, we, we are, I'm literally looking at flight prices at the moment, but I'm holding off because I'm thinking if this coronavirus goes worse, maybe I'll get better deals. <laughs> I, I, I looked at, was it hotel prices the other day in Sydney and uh, like five star hotels are like half price. So this, yeah. uh, I, and I reckon that, was interesting, Alan Joyce from Qantas said that he believes that 80% uh, of the world's airlines will actually disappear in the next 12 months. And he may be right. It's, it's going to be those that just don't have the balance sheet or the cash. So it's going to be very interesting, but yeah. it's just, it's a little bit of a crazy time. Um, and um, I uh, like, it's just people buying toilet rolls. <laughs> you can't buy toilet paper and going, I mean, it's mad. The market, the market's going to be crashing. I look at what some of them are. The foots is probably down. It's just what the foots is. Oh yeah. I've, the foots is crashed. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, um, the headline on the financial times is just the market's crashing. So it's, um, yeah, I know it's the same here. We lost 6% um, today. So, um, yeah. 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 The markets are all down. Foots is down 3.6 at the moment, but, um, Oh no, no, Foots is down eight. Jesus, eight. I'm wow. sure getting off of the biggest Monday four. So yeah, Foots is down eight percent uh today. Um yep. yeah, the European index down seven, but Footsie down eight and a half percent. And that's just huge. Oh, that's just so, really for people might might me I've, I've uh, ironically only about a month or so ago I stuck a big slug of money in a FTSE one hundred index stock. It's like now I'm sort of twenty five percent down. So, oh god, cool. that was not, uh, not my best investment decision, but that's life. So uh, it's in there for the long term. So maybe maybe in twenty years it'll you're, come back. You're, you're, <laughs> playing, you're playing the long game, Steve. So you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to be playing it now. <laughs> yeah, I may have to go back to work at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So um, look forward to seeing you soon, mate. Really, really appreciate. Yeah. It. Okay. Take care, Jeff. Nice to see, see you. you. Right, bye. bye.